Hi, hi, thanks very much for joining this webinar on sustainable consumption for a zero waste world. This is actually a recording of a webinar that I did yesterday in partnership with Sustainable LSE for LSE students. Um, it was really kind of well attended and it was great to get so much engagement from people. So I'm just doing this recording so that anybody who wasn't able to make it to the webinar yesterday uh, so that you can still um, benefit from the information that we shared. Uh, so I'll just introduce myself to begin with. My name's Kat, I work for University of London. I'm the Sustainability Engagement Officer and I've been working with LSE for the past academic year on various uh, student engagement projects with the Reduce the Juice programme. So looking at uh, uh, saving energy, saving water and reducing waste, as well as uh, other sustainability issues that are kind of topical and interesting. Um, so it's really great to be back uh, working with LSE again to deliver today's webinar. Um, so what I'll be doing is I'll be kind of addressing, first of all, uh, the problem with the way we're using resources currently, why this is so unsustainable. I look at the associated uh, carbon impacts, uh, many of the environmental and social harms caused around the world by our waste problem. And then uh, moving on to look at some alternatives, focusing particularly on why it's so important for us to prevent waste arising in the first place before we even think about uh, things like recycling and more effective waste management. And then towards the end of the session, I'll conclude by sharing some kind of my, of my own tips about moving towards a more zero waste way of living. And uh, there were some great suggestions from people on the call yesterday as well. So I'll um, kind of dive into some of those too. So let's begin by taking a look at uh, the problem that we're dealing with. Why is the way we consume resources so unsustainable? We currently have a very linear consumption model. We take, we make and we waste. This, ex this depends on the continuous extraction of raw materials from the environment. So whether that is minerals like cobalt that are manufactured into our electronic devices, it could be uh, cotton to manufacture into the clothes that we wear or petroleum and crude oil to manufacture plastics. We're constantly extracting these resources in a very unsustainable, environmentally harmful, energy intensive way from natural environments. And of course, we are encouraged to uh, quickly discard these goods. Uh, we only use them for a very limited period of time before they are thrown away and we are sent back to the beginning of the chain um, to extract more resources, manufacture more goods and consume more and buy more. So we're constantly kind of um, driven back to consumption rather than making these resources last as long as possible so that we can really get the full value out of them. So this is obviously a very unsustainable model because these resources are all finite. Uh, we can't keep on extracting them indefinitely. And the more we extract, uh, the more those environmental harms stack up. And of course, the global population is also increasing at the same time. So currently in Europe, we'd actually need three planet Earths to support this unsustainable rate of consumption. And of course, the other problem with this very linear system is that it isn't designed to address the problem of what happens to these materials after they are discarded. It's purely concerned with uh, making sure that we continue to consume and generate profits for companies um, who sell us these products. And prices are kept as low as possible to kind of increase competition and keep us going back to the point of consumption. And it doesn't really address what happens to all that kind of all that waste that is generated at the end of that process. So clearly we need to find a much better way of doing things. One thing that's very important to think about when we're looking at this problem of linear consumption is all of the carbon impacts associated with this model. I think the links between uh, production and consumption and climate change are sometimes overlooked. Uh, but what we have to remember is that when we throw items away, we're also wasting all the associated emissions that went into producing them at every point in the supply chain. Um, so you can see in the diagram here, um, the different supply chain points where resources, uh, where emissions are uh, being generated. So it begins with uh, resource emissions from extraction itself um, through to the industrial emissions, the manufacturing process, all the uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with uh, factories. Um, then retail emissions, if you think about kind of superstores and high street and all the energy it requires to keep that going, keep that sector running um, 24 hours a day. Household emissions, um, the emissions incurred when we actually use these goods and products in our homes. And then waste emissions, whether that's um, the emissions from waste management processes, including recycling, or whether that's the emissions generated by waste itself when it goes to landfill. And food waste is particularly harmful for this because it generates methane, um, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And then connected at all those different points of the supply chain is, of course, emissions from transport. Our supply chains are currently 
incredibly global. Products that we use um, consist of components derived from all over the world, um, manufacturing processes happening in factories, um, very geographically distributed all over the world as well. And there are, of course, massive transport emissions associated with kind of um, shipping or moving uh, all of these different materials from one location to another. And the other thing about the fact that the supply chain is so global is that it means that many of the carbon impacts that it incurs happen overseas, which means that they aren't reflected um, when governments and businesses are looking at their own carbon footprint. Um, so it's very easy for us to kind of overlook um, the way in which our uh, consumption of resources is contributing to climate change, because maybe the factories where these products are manufactured um, are overseas, or the resources they're being um, manufactured from are also being extracted overseas as well. And actually WWF in a recent report uh, stated that in the UK, uh, around half of our total uh, carbon footprint is being generated overseas and therefore isn't being reflected accurately in our reporting of our carbon footprint. Um, so it really shows that actually in the UK, the way we're consuming resources um, is making us a major contributor to climate change in a way that we're not fully addressing and dealing with because this problem has just been kind of offshored overseas. So the really important thing we need to think about is how can we break this chain of unsustainable consumption? Where do we begin? So you can see here the zero waste hierarchy. This is a model developed by Zero Waste Europe. It's adapted from a more traditional waste management hierarchy. Um, to reflect not just the kind of different ways of uh, dealing with waste once it has occurred, but preventing waste uh, in the first place being the kind of ideal option. So the more we can prevent waste, um, the more we are uh, kind of reducing demand for new virgin materials being extracted and manufactured in an unsustainable way. So at the top of the hierarchy, um, you can see that we've got different ways of thinking about waste prevention. Uh, First of all, through simply reducing consumption, acknowledging that we consume far more than we actually need. Um, so this could be a simple case of just saying no to, to certain things, certain items that we really don't need in our lives and businesses saying no to kind of giving out things that are superfluous to customers needs as well. We think about like uh, disposable coffee stirrers, for example, and napkins. Um, things like that really aren't required and we can simply, um, we can stop incorporating those into our day-to-day -day kind of practices and how we consume things. Uh, we've also got rethinking business models that can play a really big role here too. Um, so if anyone remembers my parents' generation, it was really common for milk to be delivered to your doorstep in glass bottles. And then when you were finished with it, you would leave the bottles out again for collection and they would go away and get washed and filled up again with milk and delivered again. And this cycle would kind of just continue. Um, so, of course, that was kind of slowly replaced with uh, us just buying milk from shops in disposable cartons. So could we maybe go back to uh, that more circular business model instead to eliminate waste from the business model entirely? We've got reuse, of course. Reuse is incredibly important, making the most of what we do have so we don't constantly have to um, replace materials with new items. Redistributing. Uh, anything that's surplus. So this is particularly relevant when we think about food and uh, all the leftover food in supermarkets, for instance, that doesn't get uh, sold before it's like um, shelf life date expires. That can actually be kind of passed on to communities who can really make use of it because it is, of course, good quality food. It's perfectly safe to eat. And we can do this in our own lives as well. I'm sure everyone's got experience of, um, you know, buying more than you need and just giving stuff away to flatmates or friends or neighbours. Refurbishing is also um, a really important thing to consider within this process. If you think about white goods such as refrigerators or washing machines, if the owner doesn't need it anymore for whatever reason, uh, we need to make sure that, that doesn't just get wasted, that instead it gets refurbished back up to a kind of um, good standard of use and then passed on to somebody else, which again means that they don't have to go and buy a brand new product um, manufactured out of virgin materials. So in the midsection of the zero waste hierarchy, uh, this concerns managing what does go to waste, and you've got different options here in order of preference. So what is the least environmentally harmful? Um, so first of all, we've got recycling, composting and anaerobic digestion. So this is about turning secondary waste material, turning waste materials into secondary raw materials. Um, so with recycling, it's acknowledging that um, when you recycle plastics, for example, the recycled product that you get isn't going to be as valuable as the kind of original virgin product. Um, it does lose a bit of value through the recycling process and you can't kind of recycle things indefinitely, uh, which is one of the reasons why 
it's not as good a solution as simply preventing waste in the first place, but of course it's still a lot better than many of the other options. Composting, returning the value of organic materials um, to ecosystems to stimulate um, the growth of more plants, and anaerobic digestion, where you are uh, sealing organic waste and um, extracting gases which can be used to generate energy in a more sustainable way. Below that then, we've got uh, material and chemical recovery concerning extracting select materials from mixed waste streams. So before a waste stream does go into landfill, making sure that you have extracted everything that could possibly be of value that you could possibly um, put towards some other purpose um, so that the only thing that does kind of eventually get landfilled is types of waste that really had no further value, uh, couldn't be reclaimed. And then we've got residuals management, which really concerns biostabilizing waste before it is landfilled. So making sure that anything that does go to landfill isn't going to be kind of leaking harmful uh, toxins or pollutants into the surrounding environment. And then finally, at the bottom of the hierarchy, we've got the options which are unacceptable, um, incredibly environmentally damaging and driving these unsustainable consumption practices. Um, so this includes things like waste to energy generation, so burning waste um, to generate energy, and I'll cover that a bit later on about why that is so environmentally harmful. Plastic to fuel, uh, similarly very harmful. Landfilling non-stabilised waste with uh, all the risks that associated with that in terms of uh, toxins contaminating local environments and water systems. And then open burning and littering, where our waste is just kind of chucked into our surrounding environment um, where it can kind of harm anyone or damage anyone. Um, people can kind of breathe in these toxic fumes and uh, local wildlife uh, are harmed by it and water systems are harmed by it and so on. So that is really to emphasize, em emphasize how important it is to start at the top of this hierarchy um, and prevent waste occurring before we think about how do we manage all the waste that is being generated. So you'll have seen from that hierarchy that recycling isn't being proposed as uh, this kind of overall solution to the problem. And I think it's worth spending a bit more time looking at this point uh, because often recycling is held up as a magic solution that allows business as usual to continue. Um, it means that if we can just recycle all of the kind of disposable products um, that we use, then we don't have to really question the way we're consuming in the first place. And it's very convenient um, for companies that do want to sell us these disposable products or use disposable packaging. But there are lots of reasons why recycling just isn't going to be adequate as a solution to this waste and consumption problem. One of the big ones is that recycling will never be able to keep up with the rate of new materials being produced. So if you think about all the plastic that's been generated uh, since 1950, which is when um, plastic first became kind of widely used as this cheap household commodity, um, only 9% of all of that plastic ever discarded since the 1950s has been recycled. The rest of it has gone into landfill, kind of informal dump sites, it's gone into the oceans, it's gone into our environments, where it will remain for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And then meanwhile, um, primary production of plastic is also increasing all the time. Um, so in fact, production of virgin plastic is expected to quadruple by 2050. Um, so that's up to 34,000 million tonnes of plastic that's going to exist uh, on our planet. And that's a number so large, you can hardly get your head around it. And where is all that going to go, uh, all that plastic waste? Um, and even in the best case scenario, where we do improve our recycling systems a lot and make them kind of more effective, uh, the maximum recycling level we could reach in the best case scenario would still only be somewhere between 36 and 53%. Um, so yeah, that leaves kind of so much plastic waste unaccounted for. And uh, more and more people on the planet, obviously, kind of consuming plastic products as well. So clearly recycling on its own is never going to be enough to address the sheer scale of the plastic waste problem. Recycling itself is also um, not as simple as, uh, as we would like. Um, it's, uh, it's very difficult, in fact, to recycle effectively. Um, most plastic products are made of a mixture of different materials, different types of plastics, which need to be separated out in order to be recycled effectively. They're also contaminated by colours, inks and additives, uh, which makes them kind of uh, more and more difficult to recycle into good quality new products, meaning that a lot of what we put into our recycling bins actually can't be recycled, unfortunately. And then it's also worth mentioning that recycling is a very energy intensive process. It requires a lot of uh, heavy machinery, um, large amounts of land given over to this process, large, large amounts of transportation as well. So it's really not ideal. 
So what do we do in the global north currently with all of this plastic waste that we are generating, which clearly is so difficult to process and deal with? Well, actually, we export the problem overseas so that we don't have to deal with it directly ourselves. Most of the recycling that takes place in the UK, in America and elsewhere in the global north, we're only recycling kind of um, high quality, high value um, plastics. The rest of it is being shipped overseas where it essentially becomes someone else's problem. So the country that used to recycle um, the majority of the world's plastic waste, or that used to kind of receive it and find a way of processing it, uh, was China, which used to take 51% of all plastic waste traded globally. But in January 2018, um, China introduced a ban on importing waste. And understandably, uh, they didn't want their own recycling infrastructure to be kind of um, burdened with all of this low quality waste from other countries. So the impact of that was that we've seen an exponential growth of informal waste processing industries elsewhere in Asia, particularly in Malaysia and Thailand, um, which has seen an increase of over 1000% in plastic waste imports since China introduced this ban um, two and a half years ago. And there are lots of issues with this because um, a lot of these countries that are kind of um, starting to dominate these uh, kind of um, plastic imports markets uh, don't have the formal infrastructure and regulations in place to be able to deal with it effectively. And this has got very severe environmental and social impacts, um, especially on the communities who are directly impacted by all this waste, which is suddenly being imported into these countries. So um, the workers who are employed to kind of sort through all this waste often work without any kind of environmental or labour protections, exposing themselves to uh, very harmful toxins and pollutants in the process. A lot of this waste, because it just is, there's so much of it, it just can't be managed effectively. It is just spilling out into local environments and communities, into local waterways, um, causing, you know, all kinds of harms and pollution and really damaging those local environments and kind of, yeah, I guess, actively kind of um, deteriorating people's quality of life as well as harming local ecosystems. There's a really great documentary about this called The Story of Plastics that I watched recently um, that goes and interviews a lot of people living in these communities about the impacts of all this plastic waste importing that they're experiencing directly. I'd really recommend that if anyone's interested in watching it. And then another thing that happens to a lot of this plastic waste in these countries overseas, because it's very difficult to recycle it, um, it is diverted to uh, waste to energy incineration, where essentially all this plastic waste is burned um, and then that's used to kind of generate energy. This is sometimes proposed to be a zero waste solution, but actually that is not the case at all. That's a big misconception. For one thing, it's not zero waste. It generates um, toxic ash at the end of it, uh, which you still have to dispose of in some kind of safe way, which is very difficult to do. Um, another issue is, of course, air pollution. So, you know, all the kind of fumes from this process are incredibly toxic and are leading to people having very chronic health conditions, um, early deaths and things like that. And of course, it's um, very harmful in terms of its global warming potential, um, the emissions that it is kind of putting out into the atmosphere, uh, because you're essentially burning plastic, which is a, a kind of petroleum based substance. And it's not even very efficient as a means of energy generation either. The amount of energy you're actually getting from that process um, is not a lot. And it's constantly driving demand for more and more plastic waste to be put into that system. Um, so the more of a foothold this kind of uh, waste energy incineration industry gets, the more it drives demand for all this waste to be imported and to be generated in the first place. And then ultimately going back to the source of, um, kind of driving demand for virgin plastics to be generated from petroleum extracted kind of to begin with. So, you know, it's kind of um, it's a vicious cycle, really. And it's also taking away from investments in renewable energy in these countries overseas as well. The more kind of waste energy incineration we're seeing. Um, so, yeah, really, this is kind of um, this is the kind of hidden cost, I guess, of our plastic waste problem here in the UK and elsewhere. Um, these are the impacts that it's having in other parts of the world. So I have focused a lot on plastics there, and I think we're all quite aware of plastic as something that is very problematic in terms of our single use culture. Um, thanks to the Blue Planet effect, um, David Attenborough's Blue Planet program, which uh, really drew a lot of attention to this issue. We're all quite aware that um, we need to change the way we are engaging with plastic. But I think it's also worth mentioning that single use culture is uh, kind of the root of the issue, not necessarily plastic itself. So some of the solutions that have been kind of quickly rolled out in reaction to um, people's newfound awareness about plastic pollution is just to replace single use plastics with single use products made from other materials. Um, but this is, of course, a false solution. So things like 
switching from plastic to paper drinking straws and from plastic to supposedly compostable uh, food containers, this really isn't the solution that it is often proposed to be. So in the case of um, biodegradable or compostable food packaging, for example, um, this might seem like a great solution, but in reality, uh, there's often a real lack of infrastructure to process this packaging to make, to make sure it actually does get composted or biodegraded. So in the case of vegware, for instance, if a small food business buys a lot of uh, vegware containers to sell to customers, to sell food to customers in, um, unless they have a, an arrangement with vegware, the company, where they will come and uplift all of those products, um, all of those kind of containers at the end of their use and go away and take them to a facility that will compost them, those products will just end up in landfill anyway. And when consumers receive like a vegware container, more often than not, we're just uh, putting it into either a regular general waste bin um, or we're putting it into our household food waste, um, which doesn't guarantee that it will be composted because our household food waste, depending on where we live, might be destined for um, other kind of processing um, things such as anaerobic digestion, which um, wouldn't be able to process this compostable packaging. And then all you're really achieving is you're contaminating your entire household food waste, um, meaning that none of it can actually um, be sustainably processed at all. So it's really not the solution that it is often assumed to be. And it's worth noticing as well that all single use products have negative environmental impacts and drive a linear consumption model, whatever they're made from. So if you're using um, a paper drinking straw, you use it once and then it gets thrown away, you are still kind of generating demand <clears throat> for more and more single use paper straws to be created um, from timber, from these, um, these raw materials. Um, and that is of course, deeply unsustainable. So really the important thing to remember here is that the solution is waste prevention and reuse, not just finding other single use goods to use instead. So I also want to briefly mention textiles and some of the environmental impacts and harms associated with, in particular, our addiction to fast fashion. Um, I think this is something that has uh, enjoyed a bit more media attention in recent years, which is really good to see people are kind of waking up to the scale of the harm that this industry is causing. The fashion industry is actually the second most polluting industry on the planet after oil, which just gives you a sense of um, how kind of severe and significant this problem is and how much work there is to be done when it comes to sustainable use of textiles. In the case of cotton, for instance, it's a highly water intensive crop. Um, it kind of uh, diverts water from local water systems in places where cotton is grown, leading to kind of all sorts of problems, including soil degradation and pollution, um, contamination as well through the use of pesticides and fertilizers onto these cotton crops. Um, these pesticides run off into local water systems. Um, this is really damaging to, to biodiversity and to local communities as well. And a lot of the places in the world where cotton is being grown are already facing increasing water stress as a result of climate change. So the more water that is diverted into cotton plantations, the less there is um, for people and other kind of living things um, to kind of to live off. Synthetic fibres are, of course, produced from fossil fuels. They are petroleum based in a lot of cases. So this is feeding back into um, those fossil fuel extraction industries. And less than one percent of material in discarded clothes is recycled. So there's a huge problem concerning what happens to our clothes when we are finished with them and when we dispose of them. They are going into landfill and uh, they're remaining there in landfill for decades, up to you know 100 years or longer because of the materials that they are made from. Um, and the growth of the fast fashion industry in recent years as well, this is really accelerating all of these harms. Um, so in the past, there would maybe have been one or two fashion seasons throughout the year. So you maybe buy new clothes like twice in a year. But now um, the way the fashion industry has moved and the way kind of high street fashion has taken off, we're seeing between like 50 and 100 kind of mini seasons in a year. So uh, clothes are barely on the shelves in shops before they are being chucked and replaced with um, the next big thing. And uh, because prices kind of get lower and lower, we are encouraged to actively buy clothes as frequently as we possibly can, and then to barely wear them before we discard them. Clothes have essentially in many cases become single use. Um, so you can just see for yourselves, you know, how kind of unsustainable this, this model is and how much that is driving this totally unsustainable demand for um, cotton and synthetic fibres, um, for huge amounts of labour to go into producing these clothes cheaply, um, and all the kind of um, human rights and labour violations that that incurs as well, because of our kind of demand for ever cheaper, uh, more and more readily available new clothes. 
Um, one of the good things about um, the fast fashion problem is that we can solve it quite easily by simply uh, buying less clothes or buying clothes and wearing them for much, much longer, reducing the number of new clothes that we need to buy. And in fact, extending the life of a piece of clothing by nine months can reduce its carbon, water and waste footprints by around 20 to 30 percent each. So that kind of um, gives you a sense of how we can start to do things a bit differently to actually value the clothes that we do own, to wear them for as long as possible, get the maximum value out of them um, so that we're not feeding into this deeply harmful um, this deeply harmful fashion industry. So let's also quickly have a look at food as another um, major source of waste that is generating all kinds of environmental harms. One third of all food produced globally is wasted. This is a UN estimate. Um, so that's really shocking when you think about, um, you know, levels of kind of food poverty around the world, that we're actually, we are harvesting all of this food that is great nutritional value, um, could kind of go towards kind of giving so many people uh, decent diets, and yet um, so much of it is going to waste. And food waste, when we landfill it, it's uh, a big contributor to global warming as well, um, because it releases methane, which is uh, 21 times more uh, potent in terms of its global warming potential than carbon dioxide. Um, so actually all this food that we're wasting, um, it's, it's causing kind of massive problems in terms of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. And when it comes to, you know, where is this problem really occurring? Who is kind of responsible for um, this food waste problem? Um, food waste does occur at every point in the food supply chain and those different points in the supply chain interact with each other. Um, but actually, it's households uh, where the most food waste is being generated. So the Waste and Resources Action Plan in the UK have worked out that 70% of all post farmgate food waste in the UK occurs in households. So you can see in the pie chart there in blue, we've got uh, food waste arising from households and that massively kind of outweighs food waste arising at any other source. Um, so uh, around 16% 16, 16 is coming from manufacturing our food. 12% um, is coming from the hospitality and food service industry, restaurants and uh, bars and things like that. And then 3% is happening at the retail level, so uh, supermarkets and places where we buy our food. Um, but there is a bit of interaction between these different sectors. Um, so the way supermarkets sell us food contributes to people wasting food. So, for example, um, multi-packs of food. You know, if you have like uh, a pack of vegetables in plastic, you're kind of encouraged to um, you end up with more than you need. And that leads to a lot of uh, those vegetables or whatever it happens to be going to waste. And you have kind of like multi-buy offers and special deals that encourage consumers um, to kind of acquire more food than they can actually effectively manage. So there are links between this as well. Um, but ultimately, a big issue is um, the way we are managing and using food within our own households and the amount of food we are wasting. Um, and food waste and packaging waste are also closely linked. So if we're thinking about reducing things like plastic waste, uh, a lot of it is food packaging. Um, so, yeah, like I mentioned, um, buying multi-packs of food uh, means that you're kind of um, not only are you buying food in plastic packaging, which just goes in the bin and doesn't get recycled. You're also kind of um, wasting a lot of food as well. Whereas if you buy uh, loose produce, it's much more easy to buy only the amount that you actually need to use. And then, of course, you're kind of um, bypassing the need to, um, yeah, the need to kind of get that, uh, that packaging as well and generate that kind of waste. This is all linked to our kind of fast paced consumer culture, which I think really encourages us to, um, to relate to our food in quite a detached kind of um, thoughtless way. So we don't really have the time or the energy to engage with where our food comes from and all the energy and resources that go into producing it. We don't have time often to plan our meals carefully to make sure we're only consuming what we actually need. Um, we don't have time to kind of um, to batch cook as well, which kind of give ourselves appropriate portions. And we're buying these kind of on the go lunches uh, where you get kind of like a prepackaged sandwich where maybe you don't want all of it or you don't want all the ingredients in it. And that, again, kind of leads to more kind of food waste and more packaging waste as well. So we've kind of looked at a lot of um, the reasons why the way we're consuming currently uh, is very flawed and is very unsustainable. So I want to kind of move our focus on now to look at an alternative to this linear consumption model. This is the circular economy alternative. So under a circular economy, resources are kept in use for as long as possible and they loop back into the economy after each use instead of being allowed to go to waste. I think the diagram here illustrates this quite well. Where you can compare the circular economy option to the kind of linear economy 
Um, in the circular economy, you are um, bypassing waste entirely. You're diverting all your resources from waste and just keeping them kind of flowing through the economy indefinitely or for as long as possible. So under a circular economy model, economic activity is focused on servicing existing goods, um, remanufacturing from existing materials so that we can keep deriving value from them. So if you think about something like office furniture, um, when a, a business is finished with it, doesn't need it anymore, um, instead of kind of throwing that away, um, it's about changing the way we think about um, the materials that that furniture is made from. It's made from very valuable materials um, that could be uh, remanufactured into something else, whether that's new furniture or something else entirely, um, instead of just going to waste with all the value within that kind of timber or plastic being lost as well. Circular economy also means reconceptualizing waste products themselves as valuable resources. We can see a lot of examples in the food and drink industry. Uh, one of my favorites is making beer from leftover bread. There are more and more um, kind of local small scale breweries that are doing this, where they basically take uh, leftover bread from supermarkets and they uh, transform that, they use the yeast from that to create beer, um, which they can then sell as part of their business. Um, and when you think of a kind of um, a business perspective as well, uh, this is incredible in terms of like kind of financial savings, because why would you go and buy like a kind of um, a new ingredient when you can just go to your local co-op, for example, your local supermarket, have an arrangement with them where all the bread that doesn't get sold by the end of the day, rather than that kind of going in the bin, you can take it for free or for a very, very low cost and transform it into um, a valuable consumer product that people will again pay good money for. So it's all about kind of looking at waste and thinking, well, why is this waste? You know, this is this um, valuable substance. It's financially valuable and uh, it has a lot of nutritional value, perhaps. Um, there's lots of ways that we can change the way we look at this and put it to use somewhere else, redirect it back into the economy rather than letting it kind of go into landfill or go to waste and um, yeah, contribute to that kind of harmful linear consumption model. So circular economy is brilliant because of all its co-benefits. So not only does it lead to environmental protections in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions associated with linear consumption, um, it also leads to cost savings, as I said, and resource security. So a big issue that I think uh, many people are thinking about at the moment is the fact that um, we are not consuming resources in a way that can be sustained long term. The more we consume, um, you know, the more environmental damage we are doing and uh, the more demand is increasing, even while global populations are growing as well. So, you know, in the kind of in the near to kind of medium term future, how are we going to make sure that everybody has the resources that they need to survive and to thrive? So looking at circular economy can really help us to imagine um, a better way forward, because rather than having to continually extract new resources from increasingly depleted environments, um, we can look at all the resources that already that already exist, that are already kind of flowing through the economy, already exist kind of in the world around us, and we can um, use those. We can kind of tap into that, that resource and um, kind of, uh, yeah, do things a bit differently and live a lot more sustainably, uh, make use of the resources already around us, rather than thinking that extracting new resources is always going to be our only option, which is not true at all. So that's a bit of an overview then of some kind of really key issues to consider in terms of sustainable consumption and production. Um, so I want to kind of talk now a little bit about things that we can do in our own daily lives to kind of challenge this linear consumption model, start to embrace maybe circular economy principles and move towards zero waste living. One thing that I do want to stress is that it's very difficult to go completely zero waste. Um, the system of kind of consumerism that we live under makes it practically impossible to be entirely zero waste. And I think it's less important to be perfect than it is to just uh, to engage with this question and to um, do whatever we can to be as zero waste as possible while not kind of judging ourselves or others for not being able to kind of be 100% sustainable, ethical all of the time, um, because that's just very, very difficult. And ultimately it's going to be disheartening if that's your kind of goal and you kind of consistently fail to get there. Um, so I'm more interested in conversations about, you know, what can we do in our day to day lives to improve um, our sustainable living and then um, just being aware of the things that are difficult and challenging and engaging with, you know, why that is and what could be different in the world to kind of allow us all to live more sustainably. So thinking back to that zero waste hierarchy that we looked at earlier, um, the most important thing we can do is to consume less to actually think about what are my needs? You know, what is really serving me when I buy it? and uh, what is superfluous to my needs. So this could be things like just buying less clothes, a really, really good one. Um, you know, it could be saying no to things like um, 
coffee stirrers or napkins um you know not buying stuff unless we're really going to get a lot of value and use out of it for a long long period of time and when you kind of change your mindset around that it can be really really positive and you can start to live in quite a different way the next important thing we can do then <clears throat> is to prevent waste by careful planning, um, storing food effectively and using up leftovers. So I guess I've kind of focused on food waste as a specific example here, um, because you know we are wasting so much food in our day-to-day -day lives. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, so by kind of um, planning out for the week, what do we need to buy? What meals are we gonna make out of this? And then can we kind of use the freezer can we kind of store things in a way that is as efficient and effective as possible? And thinking of creative ways of using up what we already have um, before we go and kind of replace it with new stuff, with new, new ingredients. Can we kind of use up what's already in the fridge and in the cupboards? Reuse then kind of extends to um, things like upcycling and repairing. So if you have old clothes and you want to make them a bit more exciting, um, could you kind of get creative? Could you find ways of kind of making them a bit more interesting and new by um, kind of various DIY projects. Can you repair stuff that's broken? Um, I'm not the best at DIY, but there are kind of tons of kind of resources online, YouTube tutorials, anything that kind of can be fixed relatively easily by someone who's not professional. It's amazing how much you can kind of accomplish when you decide this is the approach I'm going to take rather than oh, I'm just going to, you know, abandon this product and buy a new one instead. Repair cafes are also a pretty good resource as well. Um, so um, they're kind of popping up more and more around the UK and around the world. You can go to your local community repair cafe on a Saturday and there are people there with the kind of expertise to help you um, learn how to fix things for yourself, which is quite empowering as well because you get to kind of, you're not so beholden um, to kind of consumer culture. You don't have to always put money into um, buying new things or getting someone else to fix your things. You get those skills yourself and you can do it directly. Ditching single use then, something that I'm sure we're all very aware of, it's really, really important. So um, there are so many things that we kind of um, use on a daily basis that we maybe only use once or twice and then throw away. And we don't need to do it this way. So shopping bags, I guess, is one of the most obvious ones. We can switch from getting plastic shopping bags to just bringing our own. Um, and I sometimes bring multiple different bags. So I'll bring like one big kind of cloth bag for everything, but also lots of kind of smaller bags, like smaller tote bags, or even paper bags that I'm reusing. And I put my like loose fruit and veg into those smaller bags as well. And then they all go in the bigger bag at the end. Uh, most of us now I'm sure have got a reusable coffee cup, um, reusable water bottle as well. And those are all kind of really important things. I like to bring a reusable lunchbox with me when I go and get takeaway food. And I just ask uh, the food server to put the food into my container that I brought with me. Sometimes you might feel a little bit weird doing that because it's not quite a kind of um, cultural norm in the same way that reusable coffee cups are. But the more we kind of um, put ourselves forward and say, would you mind putting this in my reusable box? Um, the more we kind of normalize that. And hopefully over time, that will kind of um, just become the norm for everybody to do as well. And I like to kind of bring my own cutlery as well. Um, I've got kind of travel set of cutlery that I bring with, with me when I'm going to be like eating out. So I don't have to um, get disposable cutlery either. Redistribution and sharing then is another really great way to um, kind of keep things interesting without kind of feeding back into um, unsustainable consumption patterns. Um, so we've got libraries of things. Um, there are a couple in London. There are kind of tool libraries all over the UK and I'm sure uh, further afield as well, where if you have some kind of like a household job that you need to do or some kind of DIY project, or maybe you want to like um, borrow, I don't know, like um, a stereo system or something for a party, instead of having to go and buy a product which you're only going to use once or twice, you can just go to the local library of things. You can kind of borrow it in the same way that you would a library book, um, use it for the purposes you need it for, and then return it so that somebody else can then use it after you and so on and so on. We've also got swap shops. I'm a big fan of those personally. So um, clothes shops, basically you bring clothes that you don't want anymore and you exchange them for clothes that other people have brought that they don't want anymore. And no money is exchanged at all but you get uh, loads of great new clothes out of it and you get the kind of um, the benefit of knowing that you're not contributing to fast fashion in any way. So those can be kind of really enjoyable. And I know a lot of universities do them, a lot of kind of, um, kind of local groups do them as well, community groups. So it's always worth kind of Googling in your area what swap shops are happening because they're getting really, really popular. 
we've also got free and for sale groups on Facebook. I think that's a really great resource. Um, if you're moving flat, for example, and you have a load of stuff that you just like don't want to take with you, and maybe you don't even have time to kind of sell it uh, formally, you can just kind of put it on the free and for sale group on Facebook and, you know, guaranteed somebody will want it. Um, and likewise, it's always worth looking on there if you need something or if you're just kind of interested in, in what people are getting rid of. It's a great way to kind of um, to get cheap new stuff um, or, you know, to get stuff for free and again, not have to go and buy new products made out of these kind of virgin materials. So you're saving yourself so much money through doing this as well. It's a really great culture shift that's got so many benefits in terms of um, living sustainably and also saving money and engaging a bit more with the community around you, creating more of a kind of um, mutual aid culture rather than all our kind of um, interactions happening through this kind of um, consumer based transaction. Um, and then finally, if we are thinking about um, recycling, the things that, you know, we can't reuse, um, obviously recycling is kind of the next best option, even though it's not perfect for the reasons that we discussed earlier. So I think it's one of the really important things to keep in mind with recycling is that uh, we need to make sure we're doing it correctly. And it can be quite confusing. Um, you know, it's not this kind of simple process that we assume it is. So it's always worth um, looking at your local council's website because they should kind of explain in detail what exactly you can and can't recycle, what goes in which bin and um, the other things that you need to be aware of. So when you're recycling food packaging, for example, it's really important to make sure that you wash it out first. Um, otherwise, if it's too contaminated, nothing in your recycling bin can get recycled because it all becomes too contaminated. So yeah, just make sure you're kind of um, washing all your recyclable goods, uh, checking to make sure they can be recycled, making sure that your local council um, does facilitate recycling certain products. And then for products that kind of don't go in your household recycling, um, find out where your local recycling centre is. Um, find out there's different around London, for example, there's lots of different recycling points um, kind of throughout the city for things like uh, electronic devices. So just because you can't put them in your household recycling bin, um, there could be actually a recycling point for those electronic devices, maybe like a 10 minute walk away. Um, so it's always worth kind of Googling or contacting your local council if you're not sure um, where your nearest recycling facilities are. So that was quite a brief overview. Um, there was kind of more discussion yesterday in the webinar, of people sharing their own tips and ideas, which was really, really fantastic. Um, someone mentioned, for example, that they um, they save up all their kind of um, like bits of food waste, like uh, onion skins and garlic skins and like the ends of broccoli and things like that. And they put it in the freezer. And then once a week or so, um, they turn that into vegetable stock by kind of boiling it for a while and adding salt and things like that which is a really, really fantastic idea. I love that it's, you know, very, very zero waste and you're also saving money on having to go and buy ingredients as well by simply using this uh, good quality uh, produce that you already have. Someone else mentioned that they um, they make these kind of uh, like veg bowls out of it. So they kind of um, blend it all in a blender, add breadcrumbs and egg and things like that and then bake it in the oven. And then that's really delicious as well. So I'm looking forward to trying that one. Um, yeah, so I've also been putting together this um, Google document of different resources that people can use. Um, so if anyone's interested, if you just get in touch um, by emailing sustainability at london.ac.uk, um, I'll share that with you as well. Uh, our aim is to kind of get as many people as possible contributing their kind of tips and ideas. A lot of people are aware of really great businesses that are kind of doing, um, they're like zero waste businesses. They'll sell you things like shampoo bars or uh, soap bars. Um, or like kind of toothpaste tablets to avoid the kind of plastic packaging around those, um, zero waste deodorants and things like that. Um, there are some really great kind of resources as well. Um, like a, there's a shop called, yeah, Zero Waste Near Me. Um, you can go to, that's kind of UK based, but you can put in your postcode and that will show you all the places uh, close to where you live where you can go and buy products without any kind of disposable packaging or you can bring your own containers you can bring your own jars, your own kind of bottles and fill them up with um, like beans and pulses uh, or vinegar or like whatever it happens to be. So yeah, loads of really, really great resources to look at. And like I said, I'm trying to kind of compile these into a sort of collaborative database. Um, so yeah, please get in touch if you'd like to look at that um, Google Doc or add your own ideas to it as well. So I'm not sure when people will be watching this, um, but uh, I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up about um, an opportunity coming up on Tuesday. Um, so that will be um, Tuesday the 9th of June. It's the LSE Celebration of Sustainability. So this is an annual kind of event where everybody involved in sustainability initiatives at LSE comes together and there's an award ceremony 
Um, I'll be there talking about Reduce the Juice and the um, competitions between halls of residence that we did this year to see who could save the most energy and the most water. I'll be announcing the winners of those. Um, and I know that the Sustainable LSE team will be kind of announcing some of the most successful uh, green impact initiatives too. And it will be a really good opportunity to kind of come together as a sustainability community. Um, so that will be done through Zoom. And if you want to get involved, again, just get in touch and I will provide you the link to that. And then finally, um, we're also compiling a zine um, around the theme of resilient futures. So thinking about the kind of world that we want to create, the kind of sustainable, thriving future that we want, um, particularly at this point in time when we are thinking about uh, the impacts of the pandemic and the kind of um, economic crisis that has caused and thinking, can we actually use this as an opportunity to start to kind of build back better and do things differently? So we're compiling like a mini magazine. That's what a zine is essentially out of people's different ideas, um, their reflections, if you've got any kind of like poetry that you want to share or uh, short fiction, and uh, also artwork and photography. We're really keen to get more artwork and photography. So if you'd like to be involved in that, it'd be really great if you could um, email us as well. That would be fantastic. Um, we will create it over the summer and then the zine will be created initially in digital format, um, but eventually we will, we will print hard copies as well, which we'll share whenever people uh, finally do get back to campus. Um, so yeah, it'd be really great if you want to get involved in that. And also if you want to kind of um, get in touch with any questions about anything I've covered in the webinar today, please do so. I always love kind of getting emails and kind of follow up questions from people. Um, so yeah, please get in touch that way. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for watching. I hope this has been useful and interesting. And like I said, get in touch anytime. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you again soon. Bye.